<laughs> you know, in a modern society, there are certain topics you just don't want to argue. Politics, religion, iPhone versus Android. <laughs> and then there's this one. What's a real Porsche? Is it just the 911 and the 356? Or can it be others? I mean, it's like a religion. Well, I'm Sam Bear from Class Winners Collector Vehicles, and considering we're driving a 1972 Porsche 914 1.7 liter, I'm just callous and arrogant enough to broach this subject. Hey, before we forget, go ahead and click subscribe down that little blue class winners icon. That'll get you more class winners seat of the pants test drive review videos, our class winners workshop how-to videos, and even our new class winners rank series. But let's get back to it. So anybody who knows anything about Porsches knows that the 911 and the 356 aren't even the best Porsches. That's a 917. So that should be your trump card in ending this discussion about what's a real Porsche. So now that we're beyond that, let's talk about this 1972 Porsche 914 1.7 liter. It's really a fun car, and it was overlooked for so many years. And even when it came out, people really didn't know what to make of it. So let's dive into it. When the 914 appeared in late 1969, the reviewers didn't really know what to make of it. I mean, it had a very polarizing design. I mean, it was this new kind of a wedge with harsh curves and it was mid-engine which was still pretty novel at the time and in fact when it came out it was the most affordable mid-engine car it being about oh, 300 400 dollars cheaper than the lotus europa the reviewers liked some of the aspects of it mid-engine design these great front and rear trunks that give you over 10 cubic feet of storage room and they loved this removable targa top which lets you with four little latches pop it off in about 30 seconds and stow it in the rear trunk there but they didn't really know if it drove and handled and accelerated like a four thousand dollar car should so let's check it out and see if it does. Whether or not the 914 should be considered a real Porsche or just a gussied up Volkswagen stems from two issues. The first is, in Europe, it was marketed as a Porsche Volkswagen. In America, it was just badged a Porsche. The reason they did it in Europe is because VW had a great dealer network and good marketing and pretty good brand loyalty. Now the other issue is the standard engine, the Type 4 air-cooled 1.7 liter flat four engine. Now, yes, that comes from a VW bus, but it's still a really good, reliable, flexible engine. So is it fair to call a Porsche 914 a Volkswagen just because it uses a VW's air-cooled flat four engine? Well, if you're gonna do that, then be consistent at least and start calling Rolls Royces and Ferraris Chevys because they've both used GM transmissions and the Ferrari used the Corvette's magnetic ride control suspension system. 
when the car came out in 1970, buyers could opt for the two liter air-cooled Porsche 911T engine. That actually raised the output from the 1.7 liters 85 horsepower to 125 horsepower, but it was very expensive. It added oh, about a thousand bucks, uh, twelve hundred bucks to the price of the car. So it was pretty rare, and they're very desirable today. Now, some confusion abounds about engines in the 914 because starting in 1973 another two liter engine emerged and that was the two liter type four engine so gone was the six cylinder the 914 six and in its place was the 914 two liter which for all intents and purposes was very similar to the 1.7 liter but actually very few engine parts are shared and that raised from 85 horsepower to over 100 horsepower and significantly improved performance. Now, later, Porsche decided to replace the 1.7 liter with the 1.8 liter. And basically, the performance of those two are pretty much the same due to emissions restrictions and with the increased weight of the later 914s. Now, across the board on the four-cylinder engines, all of them were fuel-injected. Just the 914-6 with a 911 engine used Weber carburetors. Now, a popular modification, as is in the case with this car, the fuel injection is now gone, replaced with dual Weber carburetors. Does it increase performance? Not really, unless you do some significant modifications to the engine. But it does give you this pretty cool induction sound right behind your head. Let's talk zero to 60. enough to make you feel like you're moving. And sure, the car only has 85 horsepower, but with gearing, it'll go over 110 miles an hour. And isn't that sufficient for anything you're going to be doing in a car from 1972? One of the 914's bright spots is handling. It has independent suspension all around. It's actually coil sprung in the rear and torsion bar in the front. And it has a very familiar Porsche feeling to it, which is it's analog, but a little bit light and numb in the steering because there's no weight over there. Interestingly enough, there's a, quite a bit of body roll. So when you come into the corner, the car kind of dips down a little bit, but it actually has significantly good adhesion, and it really was best in class among its competitors. Now, one of the things that people like to do is add the optional front anti-roll bar that came on later cars starting in 1973. But actually, when Porsche decided to start putting the anti-roll bar on, they tuned the handling characteristics to be a little more, well, <laughs> safer so that people didn't fly off the road with their rear bumper first. So the best is, these original cars with a little bit more oversteer capabilities. Actually, they're pretty neutral. And then throw a 
anti-roll bar on to just kind of stiffen it up. The other thing that helps is this car wears period correct aftermarket Riviera style wheels which give slightly more rubber and an improved contact patch. Another place where the 914 shines in the segment is in brakes. Now, in 1972, there weren't a lot of cars using disc brakes all around, <laughs> but the 914 was one of them. It has disc brakes, very small ones, very small discs and calipers at each of the four corners. And I'll tell you, even though the pedal is, you know, it's not power assist, but when you need to stop, it'll stop. Oh my God. If there's one gripe that really comes up all the time with 914s, I mean, really, even from the beginning when this car first debuted, it's the transmission. The transmission is a variation of the 901 five-speed gearbox that appeared in the 911s. This means it's a dogleg first gear with reverse right above. It has great ratios, but in the 914, well, at least in the early cars, it has a side shifter arrangement, which means that there is a long shaft that goes all the way to the back of the car and into the side of the transmission. This means that if the bushings aren't absolutely spot on and fresh, there's so much play that it's really hard to find gears. As a matter of fact, Porsches from the 911s all the way into the 914s have somewhat of a, well, I call it a secret handshake for getting the gears because if you go from first gear into second gear and you try to come up and go to the right, you'll wind up in fourth gear. So you have to have a little bit of faith that going straight up from first will get you second gear, not reverse. Takes a little getting used to. It's not the world's slickest shifting gearbox. I mean, this isn't a Miata. Let's talk about the interior for a second, because it's actually, on the whole, really nice place to be. Now, from a design standpoint, there's no getting around that this is, well, typical Porsche mechanical engineer goth design. I mean, it's black everywhere and every surface is flat with a sharp edge. But at the end of the day, I'm six foot four and 235 pounds and I got plenty of headroom, plenty of leg room. Of course, another way you know this is a Porsche is the floor hinged pedals. But unlike in the period 911, these seem to, because of this low seating position, feel more normal. And it's actually pretty easy to heel and tow for downshifts. Well, I think it's a win. I like this over the 911. So, all is very good in the 914. And the bucket seats, they have just enough bolsters on the side to keep you planted. But sure, there are typical Porsche things to gripe about. The heater is this crazy thing of these sliders that you can't make any sense out of. And of course, the lever to open up and draw hot air through the heat exchangers in, into the cockpit here. But of course, like many 914s, the heat exchangers have already been removed. And of course, there are other small things that you know, are not the best, but that's more chalked up to the period. Say, for instance, these collarbone snapping fixed shoulder straps. I mean, the seat belts look cool, but would you really want to get in an accident in one of these things? I don't think so. Yeah, there's squeaks from the target top rubbing, but that's to be expected in such an old car. But again, it's very comfortable and you can 
definitely take this car on a long journey. One of the things that the road and track test reviewers found out in their initial comparison test drive of this thing is that the over 16 and a half gallon fuel system combined with its fuel economy gave them a cruising range of over 500 miles. That's pretty cool. So what are the other problems with a 914? Well, rust is the big one. Rust has to be the largest issue by far. And anybody who's looking at a 914 should familiarize themselves with the dreaded hellhole. So what's the hellhole? Well, the hellhole, it's right here. And what happens is, is that over the time, battery acid spills down through the battery box, rusting that out, and then down onto this panel here, rusting it out. Now, if you're really unlucky, after it rusts out this panel down here, it attacks the longitudinal frame member. And it's a very fine line between a expensive professional fix and a total write-off when rust gets into that longitudinal because that's the chassis integrity gone. But in the case of this car, this was very typical of 914s. There was rust in this flat section here, but we were able to cut it out and weld new sections in, and now it's good to go for decades to come. But always check because you never know what dangers are hiding there, and you don't want to buy a 914 that looks good on the outside, but it's dangerous to drive. So another great thing about the Porsche 914 is that there is a huge community supporting them from the enthusiasts that can tell you how to fix anything or how to restore them to the aftermarket suppliers like Pelican Parts. I mean, there are tons of companies out there who will help you make your 914 better, stronger, faster than it ever was back in the early 70s. There was the day when you could buy 914s in really good condition for, well, next to nothing. Quite simply, the days of the cheap 914, <laughs> they're long gone. Now $5,000 is, well, you're lucky to get a long stored, non-running, slightly rusty project with good drivers, you know, starting around the $10,000 mark. But still, for target top Porsches, that's <laughs> still a pretty good bargain. Look, at the end of the day, this is not a Porsche 911. It was never designed to be a Porsche 911. So if you want a Porsche 911, buy a Porsche 911. But if you want a good car that just about everybody's gonna look at and say, hey, that's really cool, and you're gonna get in it, and no matter what the circumstance, B road, highway, long tour, short drive, take it to the racetrack for a club day. You've got a you got a good rig. I mean, it's super fun. So don't worry about what a real Porsche is, because let's face it, it all just comes down to religion. You you either believe that the 914 is a Porsche or you don't. But even if you don't believe it's a Porsche, you have to admit it's a good car. So for class winners, collector vehicles, I'm car guy in chief Sam Barrow reminding you that life is too short for ordinary cars and it's certainly too short to let everybody else's opinion of religion of about what's a good Porsche or a real Porsche or a great sports car interfere with what you know is super fun to own and drive.